Have you ever met someone who lived the same life as you? In 1979, three nine-year-old Jim Lewis opened the door and saw a different version of himself. They looked alike, both loved woodworking, had married and divorced women named Linda, and then each married another woman named Betty. They both had a dog named Toy, smoked Psalm cigarettes, drank Miller Lite, and drove the same Chevrolet. Even both had nail-biting habits and migraines. This is a mirror image of life. The truth? They were identical twins, separated at birth, adopted by different families. Can genes really decide your our life scripts, emotional patterns, and even our beer preferences are also the same? Could it be that who I am has been determined since the beginning of my life? However, at the beginning of the 20th century, when the gears of the Industrial Revolution were roaring, the optimism that man could conquer nature was the main theme. John Watson was loudest believer. He once declared to the world, give me a dozen healthy infants and I can pick one and train him to be any kind of expert, doctor, lawyer, artist, even beggar or thief. In his eyes, the baby's mind is a blank slate, open to the touch of the environment. He once used the infamous Little Albert experiment to transform baby's love for furry white mice into hysterical fear. He even wrote a parenting manual advising parents not to hug and kiss their children, lest they spoil their children into weak personalities. But not everyone agreed. At the same time, Arnold Geisel was quietly observing his infant laboratory from behind a one-way mirror. He found that no matter the infant's family background, the order in which they mastered key skills like crawling, walking, and talking followed a nearly unshakable internal schedule. The environment could speed up or delay it, but it could not subvert its internal program. This dealt a heavy blow to Watson's blank slate theory. Babies start life with their own unique rhythms. This fact was further supported by studies of the Jim brothers and other twins who were raised apart. The data pointed to an inescapable conclusion. Around 40% to 50% of the variation in personality appears to be written into our genes from the beginning of life. The Jim brothers are the most extreme coincidence among them. Then came a new challenger. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, never conducted a single experiment on children. Yet, from his patient's dreams, slips of the tongue, and fragments of childhood memories, he unearthed repressed desires and conflicts within their personalities. He pointed out that our personalities are rooted in our forgotten childhoods. His concept of childhood trauma went viral and completely changed the Western world. Parents began to believe that how they treated a three or four year old child could determine his or her lifelong happiness. Freud's insights, while controversial, were borne out by heartbreaking tragedies. The smoke of World War II orphaned countless children. British Dr. Bowlby observed that children in orphanages, lacking care, had hollow eyes and were emotionally distant. He realized that infants have an instinctive desire for emotional connection, called attachment. Once this bond is severed during a sensitive period, it is more likely to lead to a life of apathy and anxiety. American psychologist Harry Harlow used a cruel experiment to prove this. He raised newborn monkeys with two fake mothers. One was a cold wire mother with a bottle giving milk. The other was a velvet mother that felt warm but provided no food. According to Watson's logic, the baby monkeys should be attached to the wire mother who provides them with food. However, except for the brief moments when they are hungry, they clung to the velvet mother for hours. Monkeys who only have wire mothers will not be able to socialize normally when they grow up and may even turn to self-harm. This irrefutable statement states that the foundation of attachment is not food, but touch and comfort. Love is not a calculated reflex, but a necessity for survival and development. This monkey tragedy ultimately rewrote the history of human child rearing. It's that first warm embrace that shapes us. Hospitals began allowing parents to visit premature babies, and they began to feel their parents' warmth through kangaroo care. For the first time, science intervened in the world in the name of love. When love and attachment became the new Bible for parenting, parents were once again elevated to the pedestal of personality architects. But they soon discovered that even with the same level of love, children's personalities still varied widely. Psychologist Kagan discovered that the embryonic temperament of personality is already evident in infancy. Babies who react strongly to new stimuli tend to be shy when they grow up. 
Calmer babies often become bold explorers. This means that love is not a panacea. It must match the child's nature. A child who is naturally shy can learn to be calm with patient parents. On the contrary, a lively child who is suppressed in every way may be full of frustration. It seems established that genes and parents jointly determine a person's personality, but an outsider intervened and upended the situation. At the end of the 20th century, housewife Harris, after combing through a vast amount of research, found something shocking. After eliminating the influence of genes, the personalities of children raised in the same family were no more similar than those of random passers-by. She points out that parenting styles have little long-term impact on a child's adult personality. It's their peers who truly shape a child's social personality. Children instinctively adjust themselves to fit in with their peers. The accents, clothing, and values they adopt come more from their friends than from their parents. A child might be a good kid at home, but a bully at school. But their ultimately stable personality is forged in the crucible of the outside world. Harris, who doesn't hold a teaching position, was quickly criticized by psychologists. But a growing body of behavioral genetics kept backing her up. She's not trying to shift the blame on parents, but rather to remind us that within a normal family, differences in parenting styles don't create vastly different children. We're different because something broader, because we have different friends and different opportunities. So, how I become who I am? Modern science has provided a quantitative estimate. Genes, 40 to 50%, is the blueprint. Set the tone and the boundaries. Shared environment, 0 to 10%, is the background. Build the foundation of trust and security. The unique environment, 40 to 50%, includes peers, culture, and pure chance. They are the plots and twists. They teach us how to interact with the world and define what we consider success and value. Ultimately, we are the final authors of this work. How we interpret our genes, our childhoods, our opportunities, how we tell and retell our life stories determines who we become. We may never fully answer why I became who I am, but understanding this tortuous history of my becoming can give us more compassion and tolerance and we will no longer easily attribute a person's success or failure entirely to their will or blame it entirely on their background. Because each of us is a draft written by nature, nurture, and countless chance. And what ultimately completes this statue is our own soul holding the chisel.